we calculated that just under two species are probably out there still to be sampled if we kept sampling in that environment. Okay, so we kind of a last step in all of this is that we can calculate an index of completeness. And it's a silly little index. It's just whatever the total number of species is that we think is in the flora or fauna, how many of them, what proportion of them have we observed? Okay, so all we're doing is we're taking the observed number and dividing it by the expected number. Stop, that's it. That is our index of completeness. Okay? So now you are equipped with a set of tools to be able to think about how can I measure the completeness of my inventory quantitatively? It, I've just illustrated for you that you can have the exact same species accumulation curve and yet have different levels of completeness in your inventory, right? Silly little example, but it basically comes down to in these matrices, the accumulation curve only uses this first set of ones and it ignores all the rest of that information. So I just showed you the effect of ignoring that information. The accumulation curve for both inventories plateaued at 16 species. Here, that's probably correct, and here, it's probably wrong. And it's wrong by 15%, something like that. Okay? So, that number C, that quantity, which will range between zero and one. It'll be zero if you have a large fauna and you have recorded very few of the species. And it'll be one, like in matrix A, if that second term of the equation goes to zero. Okay? And notice that all of this is stuff that you can do in your field book when we are at Corrupt National Park. And I guarantee you that from the second night, well, the first night I'll be bothering you about daily lists. The second night I'll be bothering you about, what's your completeness index? Okay? And if you think about it, when you only have two days of data, it's pretty simple. It's how many of the species did I see on both days instead of just on the first or just on the second day? Okay, so it's a pretty simple index all around. Now the only modifications that Estimate S makes is that instead of using the raw data the way we did, right, we used just those data that, were, that could have been collected in the field, estimate S will take the order of these rows and mix them up, okay? And in fact, it'll do one better. If you gave it this matrix, which we will this afternoon, if you give it this matrix, it will do a bunch of samples of one day as if you had just gotten there and started your inventory. And then it'll do a bunch of samples of pairs of days. And then it'll do a bunch of samples of three and four and five and six, all the way out to a bunch of samples replicating all 14 days. Okay? So it's gonna do some randomization for us, and that actually does a lot of good in making these estimators better because it gets rid of the temporal autocorrelation. Okay? Other than that, what you just did is what Estimate S does. And I wanna see you doing this in the field so that you are getting a feel for how complete your, in, your inventories are. And I'm guessing that what we'll see is, you know, maybe the frog fauna will settle down pretty quickly 
and maybe the flora will keep going up and up and up. We'll see. Okay, it would be better if we stayed for a few months instead of just for a week. But you'll see it even in the course of seven days. Any questions about this much? And but just to be sure, um, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay, it was just to be sure. This is in the case of a kind of inventories or sampling. This methodology, because there are some cases where the target species are known. Uh huh. Are we supposed to apply this again? Okay, if you, if you were going in with a list of target species, then you're just trying to make sure you find those or sample them, collect them, what have you. This is only for this world of, I would say, inventory. In a sampling world, Moses, every time I've, I've tried to point out the contrast between the methodologies you're using and the methodologies that the vertebrate people will be using, you disappear. So I've been talking about you nonstop through the whole course, and you're never here. I know what you're doing, which is wonderful, but um, if you were doing the, the sort of work that Moses is doing, where you're saying, I want one hectare quadrats, and I want them characterized exhaustively, right? That is a sampling process. It is explicitly a sampling process. You know, and it was really nice to see that you had those forms for incidental records, okay? Because that takes you away from just sampling and over towards inventory. It says that records that don't happen to end up in my samples are meaningful in completing the list, okay? But, that sampling process, Moses doesn't care about how complete his inventory is within a sample. What he cares about is measuring, identifying, and tagging every single tree. So he knows it's complete, right? We don't need these statistics. Unless somebody makes a mistake and misses that tree or forgets that subplot, their inventory or their, their sample is complete. Now, he can very easily use these statistics across his quadrats. So let's say when we're in, in Corup or when we're in Rumpy Hills afterwards, Moses and his team sample 100 one hectare quadrats. Right? Will you have that many done? No. But let's imagine. It's a good day, right? So they sample 100. So there's our N of 100. Maybe they detect 400 species. And using these methods, they can estimate how many more species they would detect, get this, using one hectare quadrat sampling methods, which is to say adding more of the same units of effort towards the right in the species accumulation curve, they can estimate how many species will they discover with more and more and more sampling. Okay? So that, that's, that's the idea. But these, these, these approaches are explicitly aimed at inventory and not at sampling. Because we're after that, that completeness index. And obviously we'd love for that completeness index to be 1.0. Now if you're thinking about the completeness index, you know that it, you get to 1.0 when S observed equals SEXP, and that's when that whole second term equals zero. And if you think about that second term, it only depends on when Q2 Sorry, when Q1 equals zero. Okay, as soon as every species has been seen two or more times, then you're done. 
And, and the funny thing is, and the bad thing about the Chow Tu estimator, is that if you keep working, right? So let's imagine I go to Corup, I get a pretty good list, I stay another month, and now I've seen every single species on my list two or more times. Let me go back to the equation. Sorry, Kate. So I, sorry, not that equation. That equation. So look here. So if every species has been seen two or more times, then Q1 is zero. And just like with matrix A, all of this goes to zero. Agree? Now the funny thing is, imagine that I stay another month and I keep adding records and keep adding records and eventually all of my species have been seen three times or more. Now what is my estimator? Uh-oh. Q1 is zero, but also Q2 is zero. Actually, it still works. Forget it. It's two or more, right? Yeah. See, I'm used to the uncorrected version, which is <laughs> equation three, which gets undefined. Sorry about that. So that's why they included that correction. Okay. Everybody ready to do that in the field? Yeah? Okay. It's not terribly hard. <laughs> 